Amen. Luke, the 14th chapter, will begin at verse number 25, and we'll read through verse 33. Amen. Luke 14, 25 through 33. And the King James text today reads, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, <clears throat> If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply, after he have laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war, to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an, am an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus lover of men's souls, creator and designer of the universe. Master, today we love the Word of God. We love the presence of God. We love the power of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, today we're grateful for the relationship that we have with you by reason of of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Master, right now the word of God must go forth, and if this is not a divine operation, then it is a useless and wasteful exercise. Lord, we need people today to stand in the pulpits of churches across America, across our world, who will yield themselves to you as willing vessels that you might impart to the people of God a word that is able to challenge, that is able to change, that is able to inspire faith and to bring hope and healing. And Master, today I yield myself as such a vessel. I ask God that you would use me to impart this word to the people of God. Help me to do it effectively for Lord. And above all else, it's imperative that the man of God, the woman of God, the messenger of God be effective. Allow the hearing of every heart to be open at this hour that we might not simply receive that which is spoken in our hearing, but also God in our spirit. We ask all this in none other then Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Praise God and amen. Excuse me. <clears throat> Had to lubricate the old pipes a little bit, amen. This passage today is not one of the easiest passages to read, and it is certainly not one of the easiest passages to understand. Many people read it, and the language that the Lord uses sounds so 
severe. He said, if any man is going to come after me, he's got to hate his father, his mother, his husband, his wife, his children. Now we know that God does not encourage us to hate our spouses or to hate our loved ones. But the Lord is using something of hyperbolic language in order to illustrate the need for our love and our devotion to Him to be greater than that of anyone or anything else. He wants us to be committed to Him, committed to following Him, committed to learning from Him, committed to being like Him more than we are committed to anything in our lives. And if we are ever faced with the decision and we have to choose between Him and our father or our mother, our husband, our wife, our children, then He expects that we would choose Him. Christianity is not for the weak folks. I'm going to tell you a little secret. We've got a lot of people in the LGBT community who have watered this thing down to the point that it's virtually meaningless. Mm -hmm. And I've got news for you today. That is not the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not what Jesus Christ taught. That is not what He said. Now, y'all are going to have to pardon me today, but I will have to take off my jacket. I'm getting terribly warm up here. Amen. I hope you'll forgive me that. He said, if any man wants to be my disciple, you've got to put me first. I've got to be more important than any relationship that you have. And notice that he says, if you would come to him, he said, you've got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, your sisters. Notice that he refers to people with whom we are in relationship. He doesn't say you have to hate your house. He doesn't say you have to hate your car. He doesn't say you have to hate jewelry or you have to hate makeup or you have to hate pants or you have to hate furniture. No, he's talking in terms of relationship. Why does he talk in terms of relationship? Well, it's easy because the entire gospel of Jesus Christ is based on the concept of relationship. We come into relationship with him and he says, when you come into relationship with me, that relationship supersedes all other relationships. Am I telling the truth? Amen. And that is the level of devotion and commitment that the Lord expects of those who today would call themselves disciples of Christ. Many in the church world, many in our society today, identify as disciples of Jesus Christ, and yet they do not even begin to emulate the one they claim to follow. They do not even begin to behave in a way that would demonstrate they've heard His teaching and it has taken root in their heart. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, yes. The very word disciple comes from a Greek word. That word in the Greek literally translates, listen, a learner, a pupil, a learner. A pupil. Jesus said, if you're going to come to me and become a learner or my pupil, then your relationship with me has to supersede all other relationships. Don't you know today that every relationship you has can have an impact on how you conduct yourself? Every relationship you have can have some impact on the way you do things or on the way you think. A lot of us today have a way of looking at things and understanding things that is based on 
our mom and dad, how we were raised. Many of us have ways of looking at things and doing things which is based on our relationship with our husband, our wife, our spouse. And I tell the truth today. Yeah. Amen. Some people, as they have children and their children begin to grow up, all of a sudden they begin to look at things differently than they did before they had children because that relationship has brought new insight and new understanding into their life. Amen. My little brother Dallas came to live with me when he was preteen. And I'm going to tell you, uh, when you've got a kid in the house, I've never had children of my own, but my brother Dallas came and stayed with me. When you've got kids in the house, I'm going to tell you something. It affects how you see a whole lot of things. It really does impact how you interpret things, how you understand things, how you view things. But what Jesus says is, for all the impact these relationships have on you, for all the ways that mom and dad and husband and wife and kids and brethren affect how you see things and how you view things. He said, if you come into relationship with me, listen carefully now, children. If you come into relationship with me, then you'd better make our relationship premier. You better make our relationship your top priority. Why? Because the way God would have us to do things isn't always the way mom and dad would have us to do things. It's not always the way son and daughter would have us to do things. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. It's not always the way our husband, our wife, our spouse, our brethren, our siblings would have us to do things. And the Lord says, you've got to put our relationship first. What I teach you. What I reveal to you, what I help you to understand is more important than anything you've ever learned or will learn from any other source. <sighs> Boy, I'll tell you, I don't see a whole lot of Christians in our world today that act on me like Jesus is the most important relationship in their life and that his teaching and his tutelage has had more impact on their conduct and their behavior. You see, it's not about learning so you can take a test. When you go to school and you study various subjects and topics, most of us went and we tried to memorize the answer so that we could take the test and we could give the correct answer and we could get a passing grade. But the minute that test was over, we didn't care one ounce whether or not we kept that knowledge in our head. Am I telling the truth? The minute that test was over, we didn't care if we ever remembered how to do that particular equation. We didn't care if we ever remembered that little uh, intricacy of science. We didn't care if we ever remembered where Mongolia was. And that's why so many of us, we study in school, and yet we become yet young adults and adults. And someone will mention a country, and we'll be sitting there and we'll say, is that a country? Well, believe it or not, you learned about that country. You heard about that country when you were in school. I took a college Spanish course. I thought I'd like to learn Spanish, and I went and I took a college Spanish course, and to begin the course, the instructor uh, began by giving us a rundown of all the countries in the world that speak Spanish. Well, we started, of course, with Mexico, and we went south, you know, all of South America, Central America. Then we went to Europe, and we looked at Spain, and... Uh, we covered all these different countries and we had to learn all these different countries and we had to be able to write on the map the name of that country and the name of its capital. Now I've got news for you. Ask me to do that now. Chances are, I bet you a dime to a donut, I, I wouldn't get all of them right. I'm pretty sure of that, okay? You see, a lot of times when it comes 
to head knowledge, we get it in there just long enough to pass the exam. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. And then we're done with it. We discard it. It no longer has any place in our thinking because if we don't understand the value of retaining that in our knowledge, if we don't have some idea. I remember going to high school and taking uh, algebra. Now, I'm not a dummy. May not be the smartest card in the deck, but I'm not a dummy. But I hated algebra. I have a problem. I'm one of those people, if I don't see the value in a subject, I could care less about the subject. And not one teacher could ever articulate to me how algebra was ever going to serve me any use in the world when I was out in the real world doing real things. You know, not one teacher, and, and matter of fact, I think I can honestly say, not one single teacher ever really tried. All they did was say, well, this is what you need to know. This is what the syllabus says. This is what the school has said you need to know. And bless God, you're going to learn it. And I'm telling you, learning those stupid uh, formulas, you know, X plus Y equals Z and blah, 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 all this. Oh, learning all that. I just couldn't see any use in it. Couldn't, couldn't get it. Couldn't. I was so bored by that process math. Uh, I, when it comes to basic math, addition, subtraction, even decimals and uh, percentages, I'm fine with all that. But once we got into algebra, I just, you know, lost interest. And I mean, I had a devil of a time with it because I just could not be interested in it. I couldn't see where it had any value for me. I had no interest in becoming an engineer. I had no interest in, you know, going into any field where uh, advanced math was going to be important to me. Well, years went by and I graduated, left high school and all of a sudden, I'm pastoring my first church. And one day, I went to look at a storefront. We were interested in getting our own space for the church. I went to look at this storefront. And I asked the man, I said, do you know what the dimensions of this space are? He said, no, I don't. He said, I know it's 50 feet wide, and I know that it's about 2,000 square feet total. And I know that the back room is 10 by 10, and the bathroom about 6 by 8, and he gives me, and I'm writing this information down, you know. He said, but I don't know, you know, exactly how deep it is and all. Well, I get home and I start messing with the figures and I'm putting it together and I'm determining what the depth of the bill. I know how wide it is and I know the total square footage. But there's an X factor. See, I know Z and I know Y, but I don't know X, you know. And so I said, well, if you multiply this times what, you'll come up with the square footage. And I figured, and I said, all right, there we go. If it's 40 feet wide and it's 50 feet deep, it'll be 2,000 square feet total. All of a sudden, I sat there and I said, Dad, gum it. That's algebra. That's algebra. I'll be a son of a gun. It's taking information that you do have and finding information that you don't have but you need to know. And if someone had said that to me when I was in high school, honestly, I probably would have developed an interest in the subject. But because they didn't, the minute I learned this stuff, Long enough to answer the question right on the exam, right out of my head it went. Because I had no interest in it. I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ does not teach us so that we can pass an exam. There are all kinds of Christians in our world today and professing Christians who can answer questions. You can ask them all kinds of questions theological questions. You can ask them all kinds of doctrinal 
questions. You can ask them all kinds of questions regarding the dogma of their church or their denomination. And by God, they can spit out the answer. But when you look at their life, and you look at the way they think, and you look at the way they act, and you look at the way they behave, you can't see where they have any knowledge of God at all. You can't see where they have any knowledge of Jesus Christ at all, because they don't look like Him in the least. They're judgmental, they're critical, they're condemnatory, they're negative, they're nasty, they're malicious, they're homophobic, they're xenophobic, they're racist. Mm -hmm. None of these things are compatible with Jesus Christ. And none of these things can be found in anyone who identifies as a disciple of Christ. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. yeah. You want to look at them and ask them the question I'm asking today. Have you learned nothing? Oh, I've got all kinds of head knowledge. I can answer every question under the sun about doctrine, about dogma. Oh, I can talk the Bible for hours. Yeah, you can talk till you turn blue, but you sure can't act right. Years ago, if you look at my illustration today, up on the screen years ago, there was a practice that has long ago been abandoned. A child in school, and I got news for you, they about did it when I was young. A child in school who did not behave right, who did not act right. If they acted up, Tommy, and they made fools out of themselves, and I was the class clown. When I was in school, I was the class clown. I was a very insecure kid. I, it, it, believe it or not, when I was young, I was very shy. But the only way I felt comfortable opening my mouth at all was trying to be funny and to elicit laughs. And I remember one teacher telling me one time, she said, you know, Mr. Morrow, they're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. But it didn't matter to me so long as they were laughing. And I mean, you know, anybody who knows me knows that to this day I'm kind of the class clown. I like to make people laugh. I like to... My grandmother told me once, she said, you know, CJ, you don't say funny things. She said, you say things funny. She said, you can talk about being mugged. I was mugged years ago. A couple of friends of my, uh, mine and myself, we were mugged going between two nightclubs. This is when I was out of church. And we were going from one club to another, and they weren't but a few blocks. And these two men came at us with guns. I'll never forget it, so long as I live. And they had them guns in their hand, and they pushed us up against the building. And it was very dark as you got up against the building. Nobody could see you in there because it was so dark. It was off the street in good ways. And one of my friends went hysterical and he was getting, and I'm trying to calm him. His name was Shane. And I kept saying, Shane, calm down, honey. Calm down. I'm trying to calm him. But he was a screaming queen, and bless God, he wasn't going to calm down. And finally, the guy knocked him on the head with the butt of his gun and cut him wide open, you know. It's not that I wasn't scared. I was scared out of my wits. Well, when I got home and I was telling my grandmother about what happened. Everything I was telling her had her laughing her head off. She was just laughing. The way I told her about this event had her laughing her brains out. She said, you don't say funny things. You're not the kind of person who tells jokes, you know. You put humor in everything. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's a reason for that. Because sometimes the only way you can digest and deal with Things that are going on that are troubling you and that are causing you distress is to put humor into it, you know. And so I put humor in everything. And that, that's something I still do to this day. But I want to tell you, as the class clown, the teachers didn't always appreciate it. 
And there were many, many a time they'd say, all right, you do not act right. You need to sit over here in the corner. You remember back in the day, nowadays they probably call that child abuse. I don't know. But they'd make us sit in the corner. Now, in olden days, going back a ways, they used to take this big cone-like hat. And they called it a dunce cap. And they would put the dunce cap on a kid. Of course, it made you look quite the fool. And they'd make that child sit off on the side or sit in the corner of the room wearing that dunce cap. Now, they didn't put the dunce cap on students. Listen to me now. They didn't put the dunce cap on students who didn't know the right answers. They weren't trying to shame or embarrass kids who didn't learn the information. That's not why they generally used a dunce cap. No, they used it on kids who didn't learn how to act right. So you can be the smartest kid in the room. And to be honest, a lot of times I was when I was in school. I'd see my teachers and tell my parents, he's a brilliant kid, he's a smart kid, he knows all the answers, but he thinks he has to be the class clown, he thinks he has to entertain everybody. And they didn't appreciate the behavior because you're not just in school to learn the head knowledge. You're there as well to learn social skills. You're there as well to learn how to properly conduct yourself. Am I telling the truth? But when a student didn't know how to act right, and when it seemed like they had learned nothing, about how to conduct themselves in the classroom. That's when the teacher would segregate that student and put them off to the side and top them off with a dunce cap to embarrass them and shame them, hopefully, into acting right, not, not to know the right answers because that punishment would do nothing in helping anyone to know the right answers. But I'll tell you, you go through that enough and you find out after a while you feel very embarrassed and humiliated and you at least try to mitigate your behavior a little bit. Well, there's a lot of people in our world today who call themselves Christians and in reality they ought to be sitting in the corner of the church wearing a dunce cap because even though they can spit out all the answers to all the theological questions and all the doctrinal questions, they don't know how to act right. They're learning what can be retained in the mind, but they're not learning what is demonstrated in their conduct. That's right. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that are that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take you, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When Jesus Christ calls us into relationship with himself, when he calls us to himself, he calls us to learn of him. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean learn about him. It means, let me be your teacher. Let me be your instructor. Let me be, in effect, your rabbi. For rabbi means teacher. In Matthew 10, verses 24 through 25, the Word of God declares, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is not enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So Jesus said to his disciples, he said, listen, 
This is the objective of a disciple to be like his teacher. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This is the objective of a servant to be like his Lord. Not to be greater, not to be better, but to be like. Boy, I'm going to tell you folks, I don't see a whole lot of Christians in the church world today who are like Jesus. One of the things I loved about the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, when I first went into the Church of God many years ago after having been raised in the Assemblies of God, one of the things about the Church of God that I admired and I appreciated was I genuinely saw people. Now, let me, let me kind of back up a minute. I grew up in a wonderful church, and we had wonderful people in the church I grew up in. We really did. I had some of the most godly Christian examples in the church that I grew up in. I could stand here today and I could utter name after name after name of individuals that I to this day admire, appreciate, respect uh, that I hold in the highest possible esteem. So I don't want to give the impression that I grew up in a bad church and, you know, I went to a good church. That, that isn't the case. But the church I grew up in, how, how can I say this? I didn't see a lot of doing. In other words, if, if somebody was hungry, I didn't see a lot of people feeding them. If somebody was struggling, I didn't see a lot of people helping them. Now understand, it may have been going on, but because of the circumstances in my household, I just wasn't exposed to it. I don't know. We didn't have a pantry in our church. We didn't have a soup kitchen in our church. We didn't have a homeless ministry in our church. No, we were all about the gospel. We were all about bringing people into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, glory to God. But I didn't see a whole lot of, of doing in the way of charitable and, and uh, uh, those sorts of actions. And when I came down to Texas... One of the things that touched my soul was how, as a 16-year-old kid moving out of his house and leaving Connecticut and coming all the way to Texas, all by myself, what, what touched me is how the people of the Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, how they embraced me, they loved me, they took me under their wing. There were any number of people in that church, Tommy, who did things for me. Do you follow what I'm saying? Who helped me when I needed help. And I didn't even say I needed help. A lot of times they did things not even knowing that I needed help. But God spoke to their heart and they just did it. See, I wouldn't used to seeing that. But these people, in my estimation, really knew how to live like Jesus. Man, I mean, if, if you're going through something, they didn't just pat you on the back and say, I'm praying for you. They did something, you know. And it was amazing to me. And the church that I grew up in was Assemblies of God, and the Assemblies of God for a very long time has been very political and very uh, much engaged in uh, this foolishness of fighting, uh, you know, societal wars and all this foolishness. And uh, when I came down to Texas, the Church of God folks, they were so focused on Jesus. They were so focused on their walk with God. I mean, if you ask them, how are you doing today? Their answer would be, oh, praise God, I'm blessed. Had a talk with the Lord this morning, and I'm feeling good. You talk to an Assembly of God person, how are you doing today? And they say, well, I'm doing the best I can with Obama as president, or I'm doing the best I can with uh, old Bill Clinton, the whoremonger in the White House. You know, that 
was the kind of crapola you would hear in the assemblies of God. And when I come to Texas, it was amazing to me how the people were so much more focused on the gospel. They were so much more focused on their relationship with God. They were so much more focused on their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were so much more focused on trying to be like Him. And that moved me as a 16-year-old kid. You see, that is exactly where our uh, dedication is supposed to lie. We're supposed to be interested in and striving for a likeness. We're supposed to be striving to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be striving to live what the Lord teaches, not merely to be able to answer biblical questions and doctrinal questions. In the Word of God, Christians are referred to as disciples. Most Christians today, if you ask people, they'll tell you, oh, I'm a Christian. You don't get very many people who say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. No, they identify as a Christian. But listen to this a moment. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Notice they're referred to as disciples. In Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 as well as verse 26. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bond unto Jerusalem. Then Paul has his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And the Word of God tells us after this experience in verse 26, Acts 9, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Notice it doesn't say that he was a Christian. They didn't believe he was a disciple. They weren't certain that he genuinely had had a conversion experience. In Acts chapter 11 verses 25 and 26, Then departed Barnabas to, to, to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples, listen, were called Christians first in Antioch. Believe it or not, this passage says a lot, says a lot more than most people realize. The disciples of Christ were called Christians. They did not call themselves Christians. The disciples of Jesus Christ were called Christians first. In Antioch, this term was not a term that they applied to themselves, but rather it was a term that was applied to them by observers. Observers called them Christians. They coined the phrase Christian. The word Christian literally in the Greek translates a follower of Christ. So observers looking at their conduct, looking at their behavior, not listening to their biblical knowledge, not listening to their doctrine, but watching how they acted, said, these people follow this man, Jesus Christ. How do you know? Well, look at the way they act. When you do further etymology and further word study, you find out that the word Christian literally means, literally means, to be Christ 
like. So observers said, my, this man and this woman they sure put me in mind a lot of this one that they follow. They sure put me in mind a lot of this man who founded the movement that they're part of. He was known to be compassionate. He was known to be loving. He was known to be without judgment. He was known to be without condemnation. He was known to embrace the sinner. He was known to eat with those that were despised. And these people are like him. Hallelujah. See, those are people who aren't sitting in the corner of the room wearing a dunce hat. Those are people who are not only following Christ and hearing his teaching, but they're learning. And in learning, they're emulating. They're behaving. They're acting. I told you the story about when I first moved to Fort Worth, how I became part of the Riverside Church of God, and I began to go around the community and do business in various places. And as I would go into different stores and different places of business, I would mention in passing that I was part of the Riverside Church of God. And there was a florist, for instance, John Winter's florist, on Sylvania Avenue in Fort Worth. And I went in to order some flowers. Somebody had died and I wanted to send flowers. And uh, I was talking to them. And it turns out they were Church of Christ. And if you know anything about the Church of Christ, then you know that if you ain't Church of Christ, you ain't nothing. Uh, they are as much, I hate to say this, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but I probably will. They're as much a cult as they are anything, folks. Uh, they absolutely believe that if you're not part of their organization, you're not going to heaven. That's all there is to it. And uh, I mentioned that I was part of the Riverside Church of God. And these Church of Christ people literally began to gush. Oh, you belong to Brother Gillum's church. Oh, what a marvelous Christian man he is. That is one of the most loving. He and his wife, oh my goodness, those are the sweetest, most loving. I don't think I've ever seen Christian people that live the Christian life better than they do. I don't think I've ever seen people as kind and as compassionate and as loving. as. I, and I'm just standing there. I'm a new member of the Riverside Church, and here I'm hearing people people who are a church of Christ brag about my pastor. I'm going to tell you, that made me feel good. But they weren't bragging about Brother Gillum's head knowledge. They weren't bragging about what he knew up here. They were bragging about what they could observe and what they could see. I'm going to tell you something. Based on my experience with Brother Gillum, you would never ask him the question, have you learned nothing? You never have to ask Brother Gillum, have you learned nothing, brother, about how to be like Jesus? Have you learned nothing about how to act as a Christian ought to act? Have you learned nothing about uh, behaving like the Lord, learning from His example? No. If you saw the way Brother and Sister Gillum lived, oh my goodness, you could see Jesus all through them. I remember years and years and years ago, heavens, it's been... Oh my goodness, it's been a long time now. <laughs> I don't even want to say how many years. I was all of probably 19 years old, no, 20, 21 years old. It was after I had gotten married and that marriage was short-lived and I went to East Texas and I was living in the same community as my mom and my stepfather. And I used to go to this little uh convenience store in town was right at the intersection of two main roads and my little trailer that I rented was just up the road a couple blocks and I walked down to this little convenience store, it was a good sized store and they had a gas station and they had the convenience store and they had a little uh, hot food area where you could buy hot food and oh they used to sell some wonderful hot dogs and anybody who knows me knows I'm from New England. I'm a fan of good hot dogs. I love a good, good hot dog. And they sold these delicious hot dogs that I used to love. Well, I lived by myself in this little trailer. And I didn't, you know, this is before the internet, before computers. And I 
I used to, you know, I didn't want to just stay in there all day and do nothing. So I would go out, I'd walk down the road a little bit, and I'd go to this little convenience store, I'd buy me a hot dog or two, and I'd sit down at a table and I'd study my Bible. And people would come into the store and there were many times that someone would come in and I'd look up at them as they were passing me and I could just see on their face something was wrong, something wasn't right. And Tommy knows me, anybody who knows me knows that these days I'm not very shy and that's thanks to the Holy Ghost because believe me it's not in my own personality, believe it or not. And I would literally reach out and just grab hold of the young lady by the hand, I'd say, honey, honey, hold on a minute. I said, I, I'm a preacher and, and, and I just want to ask you, is everything okay? Is there anything I can help you with? And you'd be shocked how many times that people would break down crying and they'd sit down with me and they were in an abusive relationship or they were going through hard times or they were going through struggles and I would try to figure out a way that I could help them. I'd try to figure out a way that I could do something for them if I could at least connect them with the right people, you know. And uh, I prayed with them right there and I begin to pray with people and people who uh, oftentimes people would come in and they'd be drunk and they'd be buying a six pack of beer and I'd start talking to them and next thing you know they're sitting down with me and they're articulating why they drink and why they're out of control and they're drinking and the hurt that was in them and the pain that was in them would begin to pour out and I did this over and over and over again now I was just a member of a local church back then I wasn't pastoring I just was, and I preached when the door opened to me and it opened quite a lot I did a lot of evangelistic preaching at that time but one day the employee I'd gotten to know this one girl real well because when I'd go there most of the time she was the one that was working and she was a nice lady and she was a Baptist girl and one day this Baptist woman said to me she said you know Charles she said, I have to tell you, honest to God, she said, I don't think I've ever seen anyone in my life live the Christian life like you do. She said, you just amaze me. She said, I, I'm up here working, I'm selling gas, I'm selling stuff. You're over there praying with people, you're over there talking to people, encouraging people, inspiring people, helping people. She said, every time you come in here, you're like a ray of sunshine. She said, every time you come in here, it, the whole room just fills up with positivity. And she said, I just watch you. She said, I feel good just watching you. She said, I just, I just had to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, I don't think I've ever received a higher compliment than that in my life. Because it suggested that just maybe, just maybe, I had learned something. Right. Not learned stuff up here, but learned something that affected how I conducted myself and how I behaved. Learned something that helped me to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ so that others could look at me and call me a Christian. I don't have to make the declaration, I'm a Christian. Oh my Lord, there's so many people in our church world today, you wouldn't know that they're, they consider themselves a follower of Christ if they didn't tell you. Man, I mean to tell you, if, if they didn't make that profession, there's no way in the world you would come to that conclusion by watching their conduct and their behavior Am I tell the truth. Yep. We got a man in the White House today that some people try to tell me is a Christian. He doesn't even say he is. He doesn't even vocalize that very often. And yet, when you look at his conduct and his behavior, I see nothing in the universe that would suggest to me that he is in fact and indeed a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, I'm trying to close today, chapter, uh, verses 30 and 30 through 32. As he, Jesus, spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 
and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, my mother made the comment when she started attending our church here in Dallas many years ago when we first started the Dallas church. While I was ministering and affirming work in New York City, I used to send mom tapes of our services up there. And she and my stepfather loved our tapes. They loved our sermons from New York. And when I started the church in Dallas, she had to drive almost an hour from East Texas to come to Dallas, but uh, she and my stepdad did. They drove every Sunday into Dallas to be part of our church. And I remember my mom telling me one time, she said, you know, one thing about this church, one thing that just is so different and so wonderful, she said, when you learn to love people, when you learn to just accept people and let people be people and not sit in judgment of them and not criticize them and not uh, sit around bad talking them and talking behind their back like I am so used to in churches like the one I was raised in, she said, boy, I'm going to tell you, it's just liberating. It, it, it just feels so good. She said, it's so much easier to love people than it is to be hateful and judgmental and critical. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if you'd be my disciple indeed, then you must continue in my word. So if you continue in my word, then and only then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to tell you something. If you live this thing the way Jesus teaches we ought to live it, it is the most liberating, it is the most wonderful, it is the most freeing thing in Amen. the world. Amen. Putting aside judgment, putting aside criticism, putting aside all the negativity that this world uh, loves to heap upon others. Putting all those things aside, it is amazing how liberating. I'm going to tell you, if Christians would only learn to live this thing the way Jesus teaches us to live it, they'd be shocked at how free and how liberated they would feel. They'd be shocked because all the negativity, the judgment, the criticism, the condemnation, all of these things are binding. Religion, rules and regulations are binding. Boy, I mean, you want to tie yourself in knots, get involved in a religion that's nothing but rules and regulations. Uh -huh. I know, I used to be part of the holiness movement. Luke chapter 6, my last passage today. Jesus declares in verses 46 through 49, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Who is it? that's built their house on a sure foundation? Who is it that's built their house in a manner that it cannot be shaken and it cannot be moved by the storms of life and the troubles and the torments of this world? Who? Those who know Scripture, those who know the Word of God, those who know their doctrine, know. He said, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. Yes. Got Christians so called in our world today. And the word of God promises peace. Jesus said, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. But he gives us peace. And yet they, they have anything but peace. They're troubled on every hand. They're constantly in a state of terror. They're constantly in a state of fear. They're constantly troubled on every hand. Why? Because they hear his words, but they don't do them. And hearing them is not enough. Have you learned nothing? But he that heareth and doeth not, 
is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. Doesn't take a long time to destroy somebody that had built on a good foundation. And the ruin of that house was great. We haven't been called, folks, to walk in head knowledge of God. We have not been called to be able to quote scripture. We have not been called to be able to answer doctrinal questions and to be able to answer theological inquiries. We have been called to learn from Him that we call Master. We, we've been called to learn from Him that we call Teacher, that we call Rabbi. We have been learned uh, we've been called not to learn head knowledge, but to learn how to act and how to conduct ourselves and how to behave in this life so that we reflect Him. Too many so-called believers today ought to be sitting in the corner of the room with a dunce cap on their head because... They may be capable of learning head knowledge, but they've learned nothing about how to conduct themselves as a disciple, a learner, a student, a pupil of Jesus Christ. And today I ask every one of us, including myself, have you learned nothing? Does your conduct demonstrate that you are a Christian or do you have to tell people you're a Christian because your conduct does not betray you? Have you learned nothing? Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.